All right, I think we have children's church. If there's any children hanging around today, so now's your opportunity to do that. Go back there. As always, kids are always welcome to hang out in the service as well. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We're going to be looking, uh, continuing our study uh, through the, uh, our walk through the book of Psalm, or the chapter of Psalm 119. We're going to be looking at verses 129 through 136 this morning. But before we get into the word this morning, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Father God, thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you for your word. God, help us to learn, to grow, and to shine that light to the world that needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. You ever watched a movie, and I'm sure most of us have, and uh, if you have watched enough movies, you've inevitably seen the scene where there's a person, and he's in this dark place, and there's this door that they come to. And they open the door, and light just starts bursting forth through the door, right? You kind of see it. Maybe as they crack it, it starts to show the little the beams, right, of light. And it just comes bursting forth and illuminating what's on the other side. Psalm 119, verse 130, speaks of this. It says this. It says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. He talks about, so this verse talks about the unfolding of God's word giving light. The language here actually suggests an opening of a door to understanding. In fact, throughout our focal text today, we see this interplay. We see this back and forth, if you will, between the psalmist speaking of the light of Scripture and the light that Scripture gives and the call to obey what has been illuminated by that light. Let's walk through it. Starting verse 129. It says, Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression that I may obey your precepts. May your face shine on your servant and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. When you're talking about this light, we see in verse 130 that it gives understanding. We also see in 133 that it gives direction. It says, direct my footsteps according to what? Your word. And so it's the psalmist's prayer in verse 135 that God will shine that light. His face will shine that light on his servant. Now due to this unfolding of the light of God's word, there's this, this, there's this desire for and in fact a call to obedience. Look at verse 129. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. Look at verse 131. I open my mouth and pant, longing for what? Your commands. Verse 134. Redeem me from human oppression that what? I may obey your precepts. And in verse 136. Streams of tears are flowing from his eyes because the law is not being obeyed. Look at that verse. Look, look, look at 136 again. Streams of tears flow from my eyes for your law is not obeyed. There are those who do not obey God's law, even though the light is there and has been illuminated to them. Why? Well, consider this. Light and dark is a consistent theme throughout the Bible. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to, take, we're going to look at this as an example. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to kind of walk through this passage a little bit, starting in verse 3. So we can dig a little deeper into this concept. Now, Paul is describing things here that are darkness, that are things of the dark and in the dark. 
And the concept is, he begins with the first thing in verse 3 and 4. He says, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are not, or because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So the first thing that he mentions is sexual sin. Now this refers to illicit sex. That might mean premarital sex, sex outside of marriage, adultery, LGBTQ, bestiality, or incest. And we are often accused as Christians of looking at things like this and hyper-focusing on sexual sin in this world. We get called out for all the time. But see, the Bible actually puts sexual sin in a specific category. Look at 2 Corinthians 6.14. Um, sorry, where did it go? Oh well. It says, do not be young together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Okay. We are actually called out, out from the darkness and not to engage in these things. The Bible said, like I said, that sexual sin is a special category of sin. 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, uh, verse 12 through 19 says this. This is Paul again. And in the context of a rather disgusting um, situation that was going on in the church where a man was having sexual relationships with his mother... Possibly a stepmother, I can't be 100% sure, but that was happening. And the church was not just condoning it, they were actually celebrating it. <coughs> the church was celebrating it. And here's what it says. Here's what Paul says. It says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Shall then I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. See, this passage in 2 Corinthians, this passage in 1 Corinthians, and all the line up, Paul's talking all about this idea, saying, we are not to be part of that as Christians. We are not to be part of that as Christians because why? That is of the dark. Likewise, in our Ephesians passage, it says this. It says, not even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. That idea of impurity means uncleanliness. That means impure motives. If we were to put it in our common context, it would be placating the culture for the sake of comfort and ease. Our motives are wrong there. Our motives are we want to make it easier on ourselves. That's, that's our motives. So we want to stay in the darkness to, to, to avoid conflict or even worse yet, to satisfy our own fleshly desires. But like I said, we're not supposed to be part of that. And if we do that, we are lying to ourselves and we are lying to others. Ephesians chapter 5 goes on and says, not even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed. And there's this Jewish understanding that idolatry is the root of all sin, but greed encompasses all others, as it's the motivation for all other sins. We want what we want when we want it as much as we want it. And there is no satisfaction in greed. There cannot be, nor will there ever be any satisfaction in a greedy heart. Why? Because we will constantly want more. We will want more money. We will want more entertainment. We will want more comfort. We will want more of what ever. But that's what the world desires. Constantly wanting more. To consume more. And when we do this, it builds within us a sense of entitlement. Not only that we want more, but somehow we deserve more. And whenever we get that sense of entitlement, there is no gratitude. There is no thankfulness. Because we can't have it because we don't have what we 
want or what we think we should have. And there is never and can never be any joy in that. None. Because we will be shackled by our own desires and our own greed because nothing will ever be enough. In verse 4, he mentions obscenity, that's filthiness of speech, or foolish talk, that's, that's talk that's devoid of understanding, or coarse joking, that's humor in a bad sense. These are what we would call sins of the tongue. And sins of the tongue are how we reinforce these godless lifestyles of, of impurity and sexual immorality and greed. Now, as I've often said, especially when we've been talking about the Psalms, there tends to be a hinge point in passages of Scripture. Kind of a but God moment, right? Where something changes and the tone changes. Paul is great at it. He often says, hey, here's this but. Here's what I want you to do instead. <coughs> Verse 5 is where we start to see that hinge in this passage. It says this. It says, for of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. See, he's saying these things, this impurity, <coughs> this uh, sexual sin, this impurity, this greed, these sins of the tongue, these things are idolatry. These things are idolatry. John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21 says, this is, this is Jesus talking. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of of God. The idea of what Jesus is saying here is, look, we stay in the darkness because we love the darkness. What do we... An idol is something we do what to? We worship it. And we worship it because we love it. And it keeps us in the dark if we're worshiping idols. But yet, the Bible says that we are not to have any part with the darkness. Verse 7 says this. Or sorry, verse 6. Um, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them, just as our Second Corinthians passage says here. Why? Because when we stay in the darkness, it actually causes more problems. And it pulls us deeper into our sin. Light cannot live in conjunction with dark, darkness. This is a, 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 a physical fact of the world. Like, like physical science fact of the world. Light and darkness cannot coexist. Because as soon as there is light, darkness goes away. There is no yin yang principle here. Okay? None. They do not coexist. They cannot coexist. Because once light enters, it penetrates the darkness and it exposes what is there. I used to take my uh, youth when I was a youth pastor. I take my youth uh, when I would, would talk about this. I take them down to the basement of the youth building where it was really dark. I set them up on one side and then I shine a small little light or I light a match or something on the other side and ask them if they could see it. And they could. Why? Because that little light penetrates the darkness and it exposes what is there. There cannot be any compromise with the world. We must, if the world is darkness, we are called to be light, we have to stand out against that. As verse eight says, for you were once darkness, you were once darkness, but now you are what? Light in the world, Lord. Live as children of light. Amen. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13 puts it this way. And it says, And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. What does that entail? Verse 13 says, Let us behave decently. As in the daytime, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. 
Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The light, if you look at verse 9, says, For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. The light is characterized by these things, goodness, righteousness, and truth. And light indeed exposes what is in the dark. I've given you guys this example before, but growing up in South Florida, we had these things called cockroaches. We do. And when do they like to come out? When it's dark. And if you walk into the kitchen in the middle of the night and you left some food on the, 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 the counter, like I keep telling my kids not to do, you turn on the light and you see the cockroaches go, mm -hmm. <laughs> You've seen it, probably, right? Yep. I also think of, but that's what light does, it exposes what's going on in the darkness. I also think of the movie the Pirates of the Caribbean, the first one, the, the best one, right? Uh, where these guys are, they're, 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 they're these like demon dead corpses, right? But they're, because they're under a curse, they're living, but they look normal until the light shines on them. And once the light shines on them, it exposes the dying and the decaying of what they truly are. We, as the light, have to expose what is dying and decaying in the world around us. Amen. We're actually called to do that. <clears throat> so that we can show people the light and the grace and the mercy and the love of God. We must call it out. We must call it out by both what we do and what we say. Amen. Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, says, You are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. We must be the light. First Thessalonians 5 says it this way. It says, you are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a home. This is our this is our calling. And the word of God, Scripture itself, exposes our sinfulness. So we must be wise and we must begin to think biblically on what living like children of light entails. I, I, I quote this all the time. Hopefully, you probably should have it memorized by now. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, if you have God's mercy, mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, which is what? Darkness. Right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change the way you think about things and who and realize who you are in Christ Jesus. You are light. And if you're going to be light, you have to start looking at what the Word of God says and how to do that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test the proof of God's will that is His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Such exposure shows us God's will for our lives. We see at the end of that passage. Such exposure shows us God's will for our lives. The passage goes on. I just want to kind of finish up the passage here real quick in Ephesians. And uh, verse 10 says, And find out what pleases the Lord. The only way we're going to know what pleases the Lord is if we're going to know the Word of God. That's where, that's where we find that. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what we're being called to do. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. That is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. 
because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. The only way we're going to be able to understand what the Lord's will is is being in the Word. The Word is going to illuminate our sinfulness, causes bring us to repentance, and by that extension, turn our hearts and minds to right action and attitude. <coughs> And there are those who will not listen. There are those who will not listen. When we expose these things, they won't. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This idea of foolishness can mean kind of one or two things. It can mean an inner object, like a, a statue, like there's nothing there. Or it can actually mean kind of like a crazed or frantic person. You know, like me, I'm nine different cups of coffee. <laughs> but if we put these two things together, it can mean that the, the, the hard-hearted person or the irrational, compulsive one, it doesn't matter, it's focused on self-gratification. And the light will expose our foolishness. But it will also expose the treasure that exists. I think of another movie, The Mummy, right, with Brendan Fraser, the good one, right? Yeah. Right? Well, there's a scene in there where they're trying to harness the light, they're in this tomb, right? And they have these mirrors, right? And they're trying to adjust them so that the light coming in from outside will bounce off the mirrors. And as soon as it does, it opens up and sees all the treasure that's in the tomb. If we open up the light of the word to those we come in contact with, we're illuminating the treasure of the word of God to them. Right? We're opening up all the treasures of the word of God to them. This is why we are called to be children of the light. And what does that look like in practice? You know me, I'm all about practicality and application, right? So what else does this entail? Oh, I'm glad you yes. asked. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And we're going to see what Jesus has to say about this topic. Now, we're going to read a parable. A parable in two parts. Now, I'm going to give you a little instruction here about how to handle parables when you read them in the Bible. Okay? A parable is an earthly story with a godly meaning. So, the first thing we do if we look at the context to help us determine what the earthly story is talking about. Right? And then we start to break up the pieces in order to discover what the godly meaning can be. It's called interpretation, right? How to interpret it. So what we're going to look at, we're going to look at Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 25. Some people make this one parable in two parts, some make it two different parables, it doesn't really matter. We're going to read it together. Okay? And we're going to break it down. Now, the context, just because I've already read it, so I'm going to tell you the context. Earlier in this passage, Jesus gave another parable, different from the one we're about to read, and he's talking about the sowing of the seed. You may be familiar with this. So it goes out, he sows a seed that lands on different types of ground. Some uh, gets good soil and it grows up. Some uh, is laying on the path and gets eaten by the birds. Some get choked by the weeds, etc. Right? You might be familiar with that one. If not, I encourage you to go back and read it. That's the passage. So here's what we read in verse 21 to 25. It says, He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Let's stop there for a second. <coughs> so we have an earthly story. You're like, what kind of story is there? Well, it's really simple. It's a story about a lamp. There's a lamp there, and it's it's shining, and then there's a player there that's called us. It says, what do we do with this lamp? So the earthly story is, there's a lamp, and a lamp is meant to do what? Shine. Shine light, right? That's what a lamp is meant to do. That's the earthly story. The godly meaning then, whenever we start to break down godly meaning, we look at the key players. So let's look at that lamp. The purpose of the lamp is to bring light. Hey, we can apply that. Well, what is the light? Well, look at Scripture. What's the light say? Well, we're supposed to be the light, but John 9, 5, 
also says that Jesus calls himself the light of the world. He says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So there's something that needs to be shown. There is this light that needs to be shown. This light is Christ. But there's one other player in this story, isn't there? Us. What are we going to do with that lamp? Are we going to put it on a stand for everyone to see or are we going to cover it up? How do we put Christ on a stand for everyone to see? We do that through our lives. We do that through our ministry. We do that through evangelism. Now verse 23 is a hint. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. When we put the light of Christ up, will people listen? Will they see it? And then he goes into verse 24 and says, Consider carefully what you hear. He continued, With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has been given more, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So these last couple of verses kind of connect to the first. Like, okay, are we going to put the light of the world for everyone to see? And are people going to hear this message and actually do it? Or respond to it? And that's what verse 24 and 25 is about. It's about how people respond to Jesus. And what we're going to be measured by. And it talks about that. It's really kind of odd. Because oftentimes in Scripture you see, you know, the poor... The dichotomy of the poor and the rich, you know, the, 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 the first will be last and the last will be first, and the rich will be poor, and the, the younger will serve the older. Right? But here we don't see that. Here we see the rich getting richer, and the poor getting everything taken away from them. Well, put this in context. We have to understand the context. The rich are getting richer in a spiritual context. You put the light of Christ into the world, you will hear the gospel, you will learn it, you will grow in Christ, and you will become richer for it. Your spiritual life will grow. But the poor is going to get it all taken away. There's not going to be any growth. It's like the seed in the sower. It's going to not take root, and it's going to get swallowed up by a bird, or choked out by the weeds, or burned up by the sun. And then at some point, your faith will dwindle to the point where, guess what? There is nothing left. And those who do not have the light are destined for one thing, and that is hell. So the challenge then is, what, first of all, what is the light exposed in your own life? That's the first question. The next question is, okay, so now that the light has exposed that old sinfulness in you, how are you going to respond? Are you going to repent or are you going to leave it at that? And then how do you see the light of Christ working in you? Through conviction, through uh, ministry, through your life. Are you getting rich? Or are you getting poorer? Are you going to lose everything? Knowing the depths of our sin, I said it before, knowing the depths of our sin, we can then understand the love of Christ so much more deeply. But the question is, how are you going to respond? And how are you going to show that same light to others? Not just to expose the cockroaches, but to see the treasure that's truly there. You see, the exposure that's brought about by the Word of God is an act of mercy by God Himself. When we sin and, and, and broke our relationship with God, we don't deserve squat. The act of mercy was bringing Jesus and then leaving us His Word so that we can know that and respond to it. That's an act of mercy by God Himself. It is revealing who Christ is to us. It's akin to the woman caught in adultery. Y'all remember that story. There's mercy there. She's seen it. And now what does Christ call her to do in response to it? To live a life of obedience. On the road to Emmaus, that passage we read earlier, and there's a reason why I started with that. In the road to Emmaus, the story we read, the two men are walking with the Jesus. They didn't know it was him. They were walking with Jesus, and Jesus just illuminated. He opened that door of the scriptures to them. And what did it say? I don't know if y'all remember, but he opened the door to them, and he let that light in, and they said their hearts were burning. Do you feel the same way about the word of God? We have to have the same desire. I pray that we might have that same desire that the Word of God illuminates understanding to us and our hearts are burning for it. We want more of it and we want to dig deeper into it. And then as the light is going to expose who God is, who 
In Jesus' name. Hey, Father. Amen. We're going to close our service with an only way to be. So, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. <laughs> Have some fun with this one, guys, okay? One, two, one, two, three. <laughs>